you might think it's strange that we're going to be examining the ideas that we're looking at today in an ethics class, a class that is supposed to be all about, well, what makes an action right or wrong? How do we be moral people? How can we live moral lives? But there are weaknesses to any discipline, any philosophical discipline, any philosophical theory. And today we're going to be reckoning with one of the despairing aspects of the human condition. And we're going to be exploring how ethics doesn't really have a good response to the main issue that we're going to be discussing today. But if we think about it in, in a little bit of a strange way, perhaps ethics does have an interesting response to the question of suffering in human life. The answer to this question that the philosopher that we're reading for today poses is one that is a little disturbing. And so as we work through the lecture today, kind of think about in the back of your mind how we can solve the problem of suffering. Everybody suffers in life. Suffering is inevitable. Nobody wants to suffer. But is there anything that we can really do about it? And if so, what could an answer be at solving human suffering? So that's what we're going to be investigating today. And to do that, I ask you to read an essay called The Last Messiah by a Norwegian philosopher named Peter Vessel Zapfa. Again, as I've kind of already stated, he's a pessimistic philosopher. He has been strongly influenced by the pessimistic, pessimistic philosophy of Arthur Schopenhauer. Has anybody here ever heard of Schopenhauer? Another really down-in-the-dumps kind of guy. Schopenhauer is one of the most famous pessimistic philosophers in the history of Western philosophy. He does not have very nice or uh, hopeful things to say about human life and what it means to live as a human in such an indifferent, sufferable cosmos. To give you a sense of what Schopenhauer's philosophy is like, he advocated for people to starve themselves to death because that is the only way of conquering the will that you have inside of you that wants to live but drives you unnecessarily into suffering and into problems and into having urges and drives that you can't control. So you can conquer that will by starving yourself to death. And that is actually preferable than living. Because living sucks. In fact, he even goes so far as to say that life is a mistake. And Zappa agrees with him on that. Now... You may be thinking these guys are being a little extra in saying this. But haven't you all felt this way at some point when you were at your lowest? When things in life just don't seem to be going well? This is a kind of comedic example thinking back on it now, but I remember there was a point, I believe it was like my second week in college, where Everything was just falling apart for me. I decided to become a physics major. I'd failed my first physics exam. Somebody stole my calculus textbook. And then I realized that I'd left my shampoo in the showers and somebody stole that too. And I was just really upset. And I called my dad and I'm like, I don't know if I could do this. This is really hard. And he calmed me down. But I was very sad. I was very distraught in those moments. And you have those moments, too. I know you do, where things just aren't going your way, and life seems unbearable. 
we're going to be meditating on this idea today. Because although we want to paint a nice picture for ourselves that everything is going to be all right, that we should have hope, that we can conquer the suffering of human life if we have a purpose or if we have meaning or if we have a God that we serve, Zappa is going to be trying to convince us that no, we cannot conquer human suffering, which is inevitable and which is going to follow us all of the days of our lives. And we're never going to be able to get rid of it. His views on human suffering have to do generally with his views on what it is like to be a human in this universe. He thinks that humans live a paradoxical existence due to the nature of their consciousness and the extent of their consciousness. And so a lot of our investigation today will be focused on how Zappa describes what consciousness is capable of, and similarly to Mill, how consciousness opens us up to new and acute forms of suffering that other animals do not have to deal with. So let's begin. We'll start by talking about how Zappa conceptualizes human nature and human consciousness. I'd like to begin by reading you a passage from the article today. I'm going to read for you pages basically two and three from this reading. This is section two or chapter two in the article. Whatever happened, Zappa writes, a breach in the very unity of life, a biological paradox, an abomination, an absurdity, an exaggeration of disastrous nature. Here he is talking about the emergence of consciousness. Life had overshot its target, blowing itself apart. A species had been armed too heavily by spirit made almighty without, but equally a menace to its own well-being. Consciousness is a weapon which is like a sword without hilt or plate, a two-edged blade cleaving everything. But he who is to wield it must grasp the blade and turn the one edge toward himself. Despite his new eyes, man was still rooted in matter. His soul spun into it and subordinated to its blind laws. And yet he could see matter as a stranger, compare himself to all phenomena, see through and locate his vital processes. He comes to nature as an unbidden guest, in vain extending his arms to beg conciliation with his maker. Nature answers no more. It performed a miracle with man, but later did not know him. He has lost his right of residence in the universe, has eaten from the tree of knowledge, and has been expelled from paradise. He is mighty in the near world, but curses his might as purchased with the harmony of his soul, his innocence, his inner peace in life's embrace. So there he stands with his visions, betrayed by the universe in wonder and fear. The beast knew fear as well in thunderstorms and on the lion's claw. But man became fearful of life itself, indeed of his very being. Life, that was for the beast to feel the play of power. It was heat and games and strife and hunger. And then at last to bow before the law, of course. In the beast, suffering is self-confined. In man, suffering knocks holes into a fear of the world and a despair of life. Even as the child sets out on the river of life, the roars from the waterfall of death rise highly above the veil, ever closer, and tearing, tearing at its joy. Man beholds the earth, and it is breathing like a great lung. 
Whenever it exhales, a delightful light swarms from all its pores and reaches out toward the sun. But when it inhales, a moan of rupture passes through the multitude, and corpses whip the ground like bouts of hail. Not merely his own day could he see. The graveyards wrung themselves before his gaze. The laments of sunken millennia wailed against him from the ghastly decaying shapes, the earth turned dreams of mothers. Future's curtain unraveled itself to reveal a nightmare of endless repetition, a senseless squander of organic material. The suffering of human billions makes its entrance into him through the gateway of compassion. From all that happened arises a laughter to mock the demand for justice, his profoundest ordering principle. He sees himself emerge in his mother's womb. He holds up his hand in the air, and it has five branches. Whence this devilish number five? And what has it to do with my soul? He is no longer obvious to himself. He touches his body in utter horror. This is you, and so far do you extend and no farther. He carries a meal within him. Yesterday it was a beast that could itself dash around. Now I suck it up and make it a part of me. And where do I begin and end? All things chain together in causes and effects, and everything he wants to grasp dissolves before the testing thought. Soon he sees mechanics, even in the so far whole and dear, in the smile of his beloved. There are other smiles as well, a torn boot with toes. Eventually, the features of things are features only of himself. Nothing exists without himself. Every line points back at him. The world is but a ghostly echo of his voice. He leaps up loudly, screaming, and wants to disgorge himself onto the earth along with his impure meal. He feels the looming of madness and wants to find death before losing even such ability. But as he stands before imminent death, he grasps its nature also in the cosmic import of the stuff to come. His creative imagination constructs new, fearful prospects behind the curtain of death, and he sees that even there is no sanctuary found. And now he can discern the outline of his biological cosmic terms. He is the universe's helpless captive, kept to fall into nameless possibilities. From this moment on, he is in a state of relentless panic. Such a feeling of cosmic panic is pivotal to every human mind. Indeed, the race appears destined to perish insofar as any effective preservation and continuation of life is ruled out when all of the individual's attention and energy goes to endure or relay the catastrophic high tension within. The tragedy of a species becoming unfit for life by over-evolving one ability is not confined to mankind. Thus, it is thought, for instance, that certain deer in paleontological times succumbed as they acquired overly heavy horns. The mutations must be considered blind. They work, are thrown forth without any contact of interest with their environment. In depressive states, the mind may be seen in the image of such an antler in all its fantastic splendor, pinning its bearer to the ground. <clears throat> and so what is Zappa saying here? Well, something that we've been investigating this entire semester is that there's something unique about being a human, right? We have this thing called self-consciousness, we have the ability to reflect, we have the ability to imagine, to reason, to consider possibilities, to project ourselves into the past and into the future as we see fit. Humans, Zappa thinks, are cursed with an overdeveloped conscious capacity. We have a capacity, a conscious capacity, that is not suited for our natural way of life.
our consciousness, our ability to reason, to reflect, to imagine, while it is useful in many respects, while we can use it to engage in problem solving, while we can use it to develop plans for our lives and to think things through, it is overdeveloped for our natural way of life. We have a mind which can consider all things, but tragically, our reach exceeds our grasp. We can imagine what we want our future life to be like. We can think about what we want in life, what our goals and what our dreams are. We can meditate on that which we value, what we want to get out of life, how we want the world to be. But do we have the power and the ability to make all of this stuff reality? No. Maybe you want a family when you get older. Maybe you want kids. But there's no guarantee you're ever going to find the love of your life. Maybe you have goals and dreams of being a famous professional sports player or a famous writer or a famous artist. There's no guarantee that's going to happen. Worse yet, you're plagued by your regrets, by the things you should have said differently, things you should have done differently. Memories play themselves back without you wanting them to, if you've had a traumatic experience. We have the ability to reflect on our existence on this earth. We seek answers and justifications for everything. But we don't receive any answers in return. We search for what our purpose is, We try to discover if there is a meaning to life or some plan for our existence. We try to establish justice. We try to think about what that even means. But it is not within our power to make the world as we see fit. We don't receive the answers to our questions. We don't receive any certainty that we're going to be safe and secure and happy, and loved. There are no assurances. In this way, our our consciousness taunts us, right? We can think of all these things. We can dream of having these things. But the future is uncertain. We try to figure out why we're here, what we're supposed to be doing, but we receive silence in return when we ask these questions. Life, our own individual lives, confronts us as a mystery that we cannot solve. An uncertain mystery because we don't even know the characteristics of our lives. They are not fully enumerated. They're not definitive. We don't know what's going to happen to us in the future. Many times we don't even know what we want or what it is that we believe Life does not respond with comforting and helpful answers, just potential answers from people who you know 
are not always trustworthy or knowledgeable. We don't really have it figured out any more than you do. If the mystery of life wasn't a problem enough, our consciousness opens us up to forms of suffering that drive people to commit suicide. What does it all mean? Why are we here? Why did that bad thing happen to me? There are no ultimate answers to these questions. You can experience heartbreak you can and will experience the death of your loved ones. You will experience a lot of psychological and physical pain. You get uncomfortable. You get bored. You are insecure. You have weaknesses that you know you could be working on, but are not. Your consciousness, as Afa says, is like a double-edged sword And that whenever you use it, you wound yourself because you are reminded of your own unendurable condition. Consciousness is not a wonderful thing, Zappa thinks. And we might want to agree with him when we meditate on the fact that suicide is unique to humans. There are no other animals that willingly kill themselves. Right? Why do people kill themselves? Life is unendurable. We're plagued by our our regrets, by our dreams that we have not accomplished, by our traumatic experiences. Suffering confronts us from all sides, both physical and psychological and existential. And what consciousness also reveals to us is that suffering will never go away you are never going to be able to escape suffering. It will follow you like a shadow for the rest of your life, threatening you. You are never completely safe from harm, whether it's physical or psychological. You could die at any moment. Your dreams can go unaccomplished. Your love probably will be unrequited People will disappoint you. Suffering is just going to keep coming. Maybe things will be good for a little while, but then, of course, something bad is going to happen, and it's going to rip your life apart. Consciousness reveals to us that the world is not the way that we want it to be, that we do not have the ability to make it the way that we want it to be, and that we are never going to be able to rid ourselves of suffering. Hence, he says, humanity has a need that nature cannot satisfy, answers and justifications and assurances for all of these things. And therefore, humans live a paradoxical existence. We are graced or cursed, you might say, with this capacity for consciousness. But the majority of our lives are taken up with the activity of trying to make ourselves less conscious of it all. Because consciousness, and what consciousness reveals to us is too much for any one person to bear their entire life.
We have consciousness, but we spend most of our life, or perhaps a large portion of our life, trying to make ourselves less conscious. We are humans, but we try to make ourselves not human. Because being a human carries with it so much suffering. Psychotherapy and other psychological fields of thought have convinced us and they espouse the message that normal, healthy living involves limiting our consciousness in various ways. Humans throughout history have employed different means of limiting their consciousness to make this human life more bearable. One of these ways is called anchoring. By anchoring, humans give themselves some sort of goal or purpose, something that props them up, something that they can latch onto and focus their attention on. So they're not endlessly ruminating on how much suffering there is in their life, how much disappointment and how much regret there is, and how much uncertainty and insecurity there is in their lives. By giving oneself a goal or purpose or ideal or a set of values to live by, humans anchor themselves to something which holds them up and provides a certain stability to their lives. By anchoring us to some sort of cultural tradition or a religion or some life's work, it allows us to focus our attention on that thing and on that thing primarily so that we do not have to continually reckon with our own unendurable condition of what it means to be a bored, unhappy, suffering, disappointed person who will never be able to escape suffering. Remember, suffering will follow you until the day you die. Perhaps some of you are engaged in anchoring right now. In fact, all of you probably are. There are things that give your life a certain meaning and purpose. Maybe it's a system of morality that you live your life by. Maybe it's a passion. Maybe it's a goal. I gotta go to college so I can get a job, so I can have a family, blah, blah, blah. blah. There are things that are propping your life up right now that provide opportunities for you to focus your attention on these things so you don't have to consider the suffering of life endlessly. Now, as it often happens in life, Sometimes those anchors can slip or they can break when you recognize the meaninglessness or the unjustifiability of what it is that you believe. If 
you believe in Christianity, you probably wouldn't believe it if you were raised in a different household. What does that say about the truth of your religion? You would have a different set of ideals if you were raised in a different household. If you had different <coughs> parents, you would have a different cultural tradition if you tie yourself to that. It's not clear that any of these are right or true. Rather, we tie ourselves to these things that we have been given that we cannot ultimately justify or determine accurately reflect reality. This is called anchoring. But this isn't the only way that humans limit their consciousness to endure our human lives. Another one is isolation. We keep truths from ourselves. We keep truths and perspectives away from other people so that they don't slip into asking question after question and recognizing that it really all is meaningless and nobody really knows a damn thing. Commonly, we do this with children. We tell them about Santa Claus. We tell them about the Tooth Fairy. When they ask us a difficult question, we say, we'll tell you when you're older, right? We're not going to let you go down that path. Questioning and thinking too hard is going to be bad for you. Perhaps the most common way that we limit our consciousness is through distraction. And this is something that I think has only gotten more intense and increased in human societies due to our technological advancements. We can limit our consciousness through distraction by barraging it with what Zappa calls impressions. What do you think he means by barraging it with impressions? What do you do to escape those nagging thoughts that you have that eat away at your soul? What do you do when you're bored? What do you do so you don't have to sit with your own thoughts and your own failures each night? Maybe you drink, or maybe you smoke, or maybe you binge Netflix, or maybe you doom scroll on social media. They, these are examples of distractions. Drugs and alcohol, digital media consumption, any form of consumption, really. It's a temporary salve to your existential problems. You can limit your consciousness by barraging it with various impressions. These impressions serve to limit your attention and distract you from those questions that you have deep down inside that you don't have the answers to, but which continually gnaw away at you. Am I going to be a successful artist? Am I going to be a successful psychotherapist? Will I ever get married and have kids? Will I ever truly be happy? Will I ever have financial security? We all have these questions, and we don't have the answers to them. Couple that with the painful experiences that we've had in our lives, questions about our own meaning and purpose in life. And that's enough to drive one insane or drive one to
commit suicide unless they distract themselves now and again. There's one other strategy that humans engage in. To help them endure their human existence. And that is sublimation. This is what philosophers do, typically. And this is what artists do, poets. People who create things, sublimation involves engaging in one's existential situation in a detached way. Maybe you look at it ironically, or you look at it as absurd, or you reflect on it. By thinking about your condition, you're creating some distance between you and it, and you engage in it in a detached or an aesthetic way by producing a piece of artwork, like The Scream, perhaps, or by writing a novel, or by writing a poem, or by producing a piece of music that reflects your emotional and psychological condition. Sublimation allows us to transform our inner state in a certain way, come to a higher understanding of the unendurable condition that we're stuck in. And it allows us to distance ourselves from our condition by viewing it kind of in an objective third person sense instead of a first personal, emotional, intuitive sense, but a third person objective analytical sense. We've convinced ourselves that engaging in life in this way is actually normal and healthy. And we've convinced ourselves that the people who want to kill themselves or the people who are depressed or the people who are suffering and don't see the point or meaning in it, we've convinced ourselves that they're wrong. But Zappa says, no, that is the logical response to what we are facing. How can you go through life with the painful experiences that you've had, with the lack of answers and justifications, with the disappointments and the lack of certainty, and not be depressed, and not question whether or not this is all worth it. That is actually what it means to be a normal, functioning, spiritual person. Not doing this stuff. This is what makes up our culture and society, but this is what people do who can't face their condition. Zappa says, humans are always longing for something and always trying to flee from their own unendurable condition. And you can see this reflected in your own life, right? You are always trying to acquire something, achieve something, and you're always trying to run away from something. Are you not? Maybe you're running towards a good education, or a good career, or fulfilling your parents' expectations. Maybe you're running towards the fulfillment of your own happiness or love, finding your soulmate, whatever it is. But of course, you're also fleeing from the knowledge 
that you have now and who you are right now. Deep down, you are not happy with yourself. You could be better. You could be smarter. You could be stronger. You could be faster. You could be wiser. There are things that you don't like about yourself. There are things that you don't like about where you're at in life and the experiences that make up your daily life. And so you flee from these things, whether that's through art or drugs or alcohol or by submitting yourself to something that you conceive of as higher and more important than you. Maybe a social cause. Humans are always longing for something and away from their own condition. We cannot escape the reach and power of our own conscious mind unless we limit it or distract it in some way. And it is this mode of engaging with the world that we continually fall into, not because we're necessarily weak or bad, but because, well, it's a defense mechanism for dealing with the awful stuff and the awful realizations that are a part of human life. And perhaps because we're taught to do these things, right? Do your parents spend time waxing philosophically about their condition? No, they watch CNN. Or they post stuff on Facebook. Or they're part of a knitting club, right? We have desires, goals, and dreams that we have no certainty of achieving and no way of meeting them all. You have desires that once they are satiated, another desire just comes right back, right? A never-ending pursuit of the fulfillment of your desires that in the end is just inevitably going to disappoint you. You really want to date that person. Oh, then you find out they're not so great. You're hungry, so you eat. You're going to be hungry again in a few hours, so you got to do that again. We're stuck in never-ending cycles of trying to fulfill our desires. Doing this does not make us feel whole or fulfilled. And so we engage in some of these activities. Our technological progress has not helped the situation either. Zappa was not only a, a writer and a philosopher, but he's a mountaineer. And along with Aldo Leopold, he laments the state that humans are in because of our technological advancements and how it has alienated us from nature. We are harmed further by the fact that we don't spend enough time in nature. We don't really think about nature. Our technological advancements have transformed human society and human life into a mode of existence which is not, which is not authentically and helpfully spiritual. It's shallow surface level. It's all about consumption. One way that we could perhaps endure our situation a little bit better is by spending time in nature. But we don't really do that. As humanity grows and as our societies evolve, we are becoming increasingly alienated 
from the thing that would allow us to truly spiritually live on this earth as natural beings. Spending time in natural habitats. And it's clear that while our technological progress has helped us in a lot of ways and has made life more convenient, it doesn't really fulfill us, does it? Does anybody feel whole or complete or fulfilled after four hours spent on Instagram? No. Or four hours spent watching YouTube videos? Or four hours arguing with people on Twitter? No, it just pisses you off, right? You go to bed in a bad mood or in a sour mood or with the realization that you just did something that you probably shouldn't have done. Darn, you could have meditated or you could have worked out, but instead you spent time on Facebook. Technological progress has also impacted our relationships with other people, right? It's impacted our relationships with others. It's impacted how we view and how we interact with other people. It's brought us a lot of convenience, but it's only making our condition worse, Zappa thinks. He takes this pessimistic view of life all the way to its logical conclusion. And this is where his philosophy intersects with ethics. Why I've decided to include what he's saying here in this class. <coughs> Zappa thinks that we will never be able to escape our dreaded situation of suffering, being stalked by the shadow of suffering our entire lives, as long as we live, due to the fact that we have this enormously powerful consciousness which can't help but think and consider and plague us with thoughts and worries and insecurities. As long as we live, we are going to be plagued by our consciousness. And it's not just you, it's everyone else in existence as well. Everyone else is also stuck in this condition of dreaming, of wanting, of desiring, but not having the certainty or the power to make the world fit into your plans and according to your will. We're never going to be able to escape this situation except, except if we do one thing <coughs> there is one way out. If we continue these considerations to the bitter end, then the conclusion is not in doubt. As long as humankind recklessly proceeds in the faithful delusion of being biologically fated for triumph, nothing essential will change. 
as its numbers mount and the spiritual atmosphere thickens, the techniques of protection must assume an increasingly brutal character. And humans will persist in dreaming of salvation and affirmation and a new Messiah. Yet, when many saviors have been nailed to trees and stoned on the city squares, then the last Messiah shall come. Then will appear the man who, as the first of all, has dared strip his soul naked and submit it alive to the utmost thought of the lineage, the very idea of doom. A man who has fathomed life and its cosmic ground and whose pain is the earth's collective pain. With what furious screams shall not mobs of all nations cry out for his thousandfold death when like a cloth his voice encloses the globe and the strange message has resounded for the first and last time. The life of the worlds is a roaring river, but earth's is a pond and a backwater. The sign of doom is written on your brows. How long will ye kick against the pinpricks? But there is but one conquest and one crown, one redemption and one solution. Know yourselves. Be infertile and let the earth be silent after ye. And when he has spoken, they will pour themselves over him, led by the pacifier makers and the midwives, and bury him in their fingernails. He is the last Messiah. As son from father, he stems from the archer by the water hole. The only way we're going to get out of this situation is if we let ourselves die off. Having children is going to keep suffering alive forever. We can eliminate suffering if we simply stop procreating. That is the only way. As long as people continue to have kids, suffering will persist and will haunt them until the day that they die. By allowing ourselves to go extinct, we can escape the suffering forever. The last Messiah is the person who convinces humanity to stop procreating. And what Zappa has been considering this whole time is a question that lies at the heart of ethics and morality. People suffer. Unnecessary suffering is not good. Do we have some sort of moral obligation to eliminate suffering? And if we do, does that mean we have a moral obligation to stop having kids?
What do you think? Is bringing an innocent child into this world justifiable? Or is life too burdensome and contains too much suffering that we should give up on the project of having kids? Zappa thinks that is the ethical thing to do. For as long as we keep having kids, humans will continue to suffer. What do you all think about his views? About his antinatalist views? Yes. I mean, I think, like, I never really thought about it like this, about how, like, us bringing children into the world, like, kind of, like, they're so innocent when they get here, but then they could get ruined by so many things, like, in the world, like, there's so much, so many terrible things that could go wrong, and, you know, how hard life can get, but, like, I also do think that's part of being human, is, like, learning to endure those it makes you a better person. So I don't know if I would say that like we shouldn't reproduce anymore, we should stop having children and let like humans go go extinct. But like I do I do understand what he's saying, that like you have to be very careful about how you treat your kids and like how you raise them. Think about the suffering it brings on you to have kids. What would your heart do if anything ever happened? Can you imagine, even for a second, how you would feel if your daughter was a victim of sexual assault? How that would impact her? You brought her into this life. Without you, that wouldn't have happened. Right? Or is the human project worth continuance? Does anybody here, antinatalist, think we should stop having kids? Do you want to comment on that? Um, people suck, and I can't think of one reason to have your own kid that isn't selfish. Say more about that. Why, why would it be selfish to have your own biological child? Because you're just bringing a kid in the world because you can, and I feel like Somebody told me the other day that she wishes that she was pregnant at 18 years old so that she could have a best friend for life. I was like, what the hell are you talking about? You probably should never have kids. And she laughed at me. And I feel like that's like what parents think. Like, you can have kids. You're just best friend for life. And it's great for you. It sucks for them. They don't like it. You know? People suck. I agree. A lot of people suck. I didn't ask to be born. None of you asked to be born. You didn't have a choice over what kind of upbringing you had or the parents that you had or the traits, the intelligence, the physicality that you have. Your life undoubtedly has suffering in it. Is your life worth the suffering? For some people, it's not. Right? For them, life is not worth it. They kill themselves. Either all at once or very slowly through decades of alcohol and drug abuse. Does anybody here think we should keep having kids? Like, having kids is good. You want to comment on that? Um... It, it makes sense when you see it as humans are the problem, so it's just you get rid of the problem completely, but it's just I think some people understand our suffering, and from that we can build off that and we could start to improve. I just don't think that cutting off a whole race is just the answer. I think it would eliminate suffering, I mean, right? yeah, but it's just... But maybe you think that 
that dramatic of a solution is not worth it. It's just giving up, and I don't really like giving up. Like, it's just, we can keep being better, and we can try to do better. Of course, suffering's always going to happen, but if you could try to look more positively at the good things in life, then that could keep on living. Like what? Friends, family. Like, life sucks right now. But I'm, <laughs> You're I'm like, I don't know, don't ask me. <laughs> I'm trying to... I'm sure there forward. are things out there, you I'm, know? I'm pushing forward for me, um, my sister, my parents, because I owe it to them. And mm. I would hate to see them or give them that feeling of losing someone important. Do you know what I'm saying? Sure. Like... Me, personally, I try to live for other, not for other people, but for the people I care about. And I think because of that, and if we have more people with that type of thinking, we could better future generations. Mm. What were you going to say, Peyton? Um, <clears throat> I feel like it's not really that deep. Like. <laughs> you don't think so? No, like, suffering is a part of life. Like, it's just how it is. That too. <laughs> So what does that imply about it? <clears throat> Suck it up, buttercup. And also, he's implying that like every child that is born is automatically creating like people that hate everything in life. But I feel like most people, like before they kind of experience that, dep- I feel like that sort of suffering isn't really a part of, I don't know. I just feel like that's not really on, like, even people who suffer, like, that's not really on their mind. Like, they can still appreciate the good things in life. Okay. But you could also, like, spin it, like, there are a lot of great things that come with being alive. Like, of course, nobody has to be born, but I wouldn't say, like, choosing to have children is just choosing to create more suffering. Hmm. Those, of course... Your kids are going to suffer, and they're going to bring suffering on other people, though, right? Inevitably. Like, they're not going to live perfect lives, right? Yeah. Should we be worried about the suffering that our children are going to create, either for ourselves or themselves or others? I mean, you can just raise them the best you can, but that's a part of the Yeah. I feel like a lot of parents are are and have raised their kids the best that they can and they still didn't turn out very good, right? (laughs) To be a little frank. Maybe the question turns on whether or not you think there's intrinsic value to life. There are a lot of people who think their life is not worth living. But do you think if you were given the opportunity to live, come whatever may, or to have never existed at all, you would choose to have never existed at all? Is there anybody who would choose to have never existed at all? Some days. What does that say about some sort of ethical duty or obligation we might have to stop procreating. After all, you know, like we've said, children don't have an option to come into the world or not, right? They didn't ask to be born. They don't get to construct their lives, their upbringing as they see fit. And for a lot of people, their lives end up being terrible. Anybody else think that we should keep having kids? Who here wants kids? Why do you want kids? I feel like I've lived like a pretty good life. I want to be able to do that for my kids someday. Okay. So you want to you want to give them the experiences and the opportunities that you've had? I feel like the majority of life. I mean, this is your choice to be here, so if you think college is miserable, then leave it. 
if you have your own choices in life, you can make your way. So that's cool. Yeah. Although in virtue of being born to certain parents, we're locked into relationships with others that put certain constraints on our lives, right? When you're in a relationship with someone, what they think and how they feel is necessarily going to impact what you do and what you think and how you feel, right? Our free freedom is constrained in a lot of ways by the relationships that we're in. But maybe you think the potential for life outweighs all of these considerations, you know? Who else wants to have kids? Why? I feel like, like, they should get the chance. Like, everyone should have a chance to, like, make their life the way that they want to. Like, some days, yeah, for sure, I wish I wasn't born. Like, everyone has bad days. But I don't think that it's right to, like, assume that all kids don't want the opportunity or that they, like, feel obligated that they have to, like, come into this life. Like, me personally, like, I like my life. I feel like I'm, I have a lot of, like, freedom and things to make it how I want to. Like, I, a lot of people don't have to do the things that I do. A lot of people wouldn't go eight hours from home to come to college. Like, I made that decision. Like, I think that my kids should have the chance to do the same. Okay. Do you think we have a duty to have kids? Maybe you don't feel like you have a duty, but do you think the human race has a duty to procreate? It would be fine if we just let ourselves die out, like we wouldn't be doing anything morally wrong if we did that. I feel like if we thought like that, then we shouldn't be trying to like, I don't know, try to advance in certain fields, you know? Like trying to do oh. better in technology or like build better societies. Like if we just think we should just cut off the human race then like why should we even try with anything else it's interesting i don't know it's a good question it seems like a lot of you aren't convinced by zappa's argument here who is not convinced anybody else do you want to Offer a response as to why, Paige? Um, I would just say, because, like, like everybody said, you know, life has stuff in it. And you know, some people get dealt worse things than others, and, like, that's kind of how it goes, and that's a part of growing and living. So I think your response to it is, like, why some people suffer more than others. Like, yeah, if you have mm. something that happens to you and you respond very negatively to it, then, yeah, your life is going to feel really crappy. But if you, like, pick yourself up and you move on and you realize that life goes on, your life will be better. So you're saying we have some sort of control over how much we suffer? Do you think life is intrinsically valuable? Yeah. I think like we all the like other people said we all deserve a chance to live a life. And like we all should just, you know, live every day as like it could be our last because like you never really know and you know, there's some great things that are gonna happen to you and some bad things that are gonna happen to you, but like you should just think to yourself like, you know, I'm here for a reason. Okay. Is there anybody who thinks that we don't actually have much control at all over how much we suffer? Is it a matter of chance or luck? Yeah, do you want to comment on that? Um, my life sucks, and I think I became a decent person out of it, and I'm not going to, like, kill myself or anything because I'm stuck here, and I might as well just see how this thing plays out, you know? Okay, so you're kind of curious about the future, but you're not, like, extremely hopeful about it. Yeah. I think there's definitely going to be parts of stuff, but I think there's going to be some parts that are fun. Okay. Do you have a response? I feel like you being here and deciding to be here, you're, you're choosing to go through that summer, whether it's, whether it's 
down on the one day or you get up in, in the morning and you're like, okay, whatever, mm -hmm. I feel like you're choosing to suffer as long as you're sitting here because like life sucks sometimes. But I think that you determine how, how long you take it. Okay, so you you also think this. Yeah. Okay. Albert Camus famously said that the only question worth asking is whether or not to commit suicide. Meditate on that this weekend as you think about this issue of natalism and of antinatalism. Okay. Thank you for coming, everybody.